Hej så. Øh, mit navn er Martin Plæsner. Jacobsen? Okay, vi switcher til engelsk. Okay, fair enough. Hi, my name is Martin Plæsner Jacobsen. I'm uh, working as a SE in Denmark. And uh, together with me, uh, I have Preben Berg. Pre, will you introduce yourself? There you go. I'll just use this microphone. Yes, I'm the I'm lead solution architect for Veeam in Europe. I, yeah, some of you probably know me already. Um, yeah, so I will be presenting on our visa integration towards the end of the presentation, and Martin will basically start off with telling you about the new features of version 9.5, uh, which are mainly focused around our new integration with ReFS file system version 3, which is part of uh, Windows Server 2016. So, yeah. yeah. And uh, to add to that is also the, the other main reason why we, we introduced uh, version 9.5 is actually the whole Windows Server 2016 the hypervisor and all the, the enterprise applications. So so 9.5 is out because of, of those reasons. So let me go ahead and start. So uh, what I'm going to cover is a little bit about uh, Server 2016 and ReFS. So what we recommend now is that the, that ReFS is our new file system to do backup to. So whether it's, it's regular backup or backup copy jobs, if you could get a ReFS underneath, there's a lot of benefits. So let me explain what the benefits are. So first of all, uh, Veeam, we're, we're able to talk with an API on the, the, the file system. So instead of just talking file system, regular file system, we can actually talk block through an API. And that means we can, we can do some block cloning by just updating metadata. So let me explain how that works. So let's imagine we have a ReFS file system. So just to highlight a little bit, a little bit of what ReFS is. So ReFS is just like NTFS and FAT in the old days. So it's the new file system from, from Microsoft. And they, they state that this is going to be the file si system of a de the next, next couple of decades. So Microsoft is putting everything into this file system. So let's imagine we have a ReFS uh, partition. So a partition is always divided into two things. There's a metadata that tells about the data block, what files they belong, and there's the actual data blocks. So when we're placing files on a file system, you always have this metadata that, that, that says that this file is contained by these blocks and, and the different blocks uh, addresses in the block system. And then when we add the new files, we continue to add blocks to this uh, file system, and of course, the metadata is, is updated. And we continue doing this, adding data onto it. It's the regular NTFS, uh, what we used to do. So what we can do in ReFS is that we can, we can trigger an API called block cloning. So block cloning actually means that now we can create a new file, but state that this file contains of the same block as another file. So now we get the same file duplicated, but the data size stays within. So it's the same data size. And then we can update one of them, or then we can, can use this plone, uh, sorry, block cloning to merge. So we can take files and merge them together without actually moving any data at all, which is just merge the metadata. That means that the, now we have two files that, that are not the same, but the, the, uh, the data store is the same. So that means we get a kind of a dedupe, I wouldn't call it dedupe, but it's a kind of a space saving technology using pointers. Okay, that also means that we can save space. So let's imagine each block, just to put it <coughs> up, is, is one gig. That means that right now the file system says that we have uh, 10 gigs because we have 10 different blocks or 10 blocks up here. But in reality, we're only using seven because we only have seven data blocks. So we're, we're gaining some kind of dedupe or space saving. So just to before we move on and talk about all the good stuff that this gives us, you can see the, the idea of, of copying files is very easy because you simply just clone the files and they refer to the same and merging is really good. But just a couple of things that I want to highlight first. There are, there are some limitations to this. So first of all, we only, um, if you trigger an active fool in Veeam console, it's still an active fool then we don't use this, this technology to reference to multiple blocks. Then it is a new active fool. But that's also good that we can actually make, say, okay, I don't trust in the data is, I can make a new active fool. So that's just one thing you have to remember. Another thing you have to remember is that we are using this API or this block cloning technology 
only when we are building files onto the VFS, not if we copy files to and from the volume. So that means if I'm copying all these files out of a VFS onto an NTFS or onto another VFS, data explodes. It comes back in the real size. Okay, kind of the real sizes, okay? So that's another thing to remember. This is very important. Also, block API only works in VFS uh, partitions, and there's a limit of 16 etcher bytes. I think there's something new I have to learn here to say. So that's roughly 60 uh, million terabytes. But okay, that's a good limit to start with, right? Um, that also means that we cannot get this kind of block cloning uh, between two VFS. So we cannot expect to have dedupe or space saving within two, two VFS. It's only within the same VFS volume. Okay? So that's the limitation. So here's all the... Oh, sorry, I, I forgot one. Uh, we are not doing it on incrementals, because incrementals are normally 99% unique, so there's no reference points to it. We're only doing it around full, so that's another thing to remember. I will make sure you guys get the slides, or at least uh, reach out to me to get the slides. So that's the limitations we, we're seeing right now. The cool thing about this is that now we get a repository supported for any hypervisors and our new agents backup. So this is used for any hypervisor. Even though it's a Microsoft technology, we can still use it as a VMware repository, okay? Or agent repository. It gives us the fast merge. So now we can merge files by just updating metadata. It's gonna go super fast. I will go through that in a second. Um, we can create new synthetic full. We can make new these grandfather file son, big uh, chunks of data. We can make them really fast because we're simply just cloning uh, files. Uh, and there's no pr uh, post processing in this dedupe. Everything is happening when we're doing the, the merge or when we're building new full. It's not a post process. We don't need CPU and high IOPS. It is almost a read only operation to the storage because we simply just made updating metadata afterwards. And you got encryption support, so you, you can run encryption on top of this. Because the blocks can be encrypted, but still owned by multiple files. It's the same, same block. So encryption is the full support. So if you have problems today with the global dedupe and encryption, here's one of your solutions. So all this becomes a backup. Backup will, will be read-only. That means that now we can make repositories optimal just for writing data. But hang on a second. Remember that we still need read performance to recover. But put it on the ads, we only need to write when we do backup. That's pretty cool. I know a uh, performance uh, downgrade on uh, vPower. So when we start machines from this, it's not global deduped, it's not compressed or anything, like really hard. So we can still start from this format, even though it's it's kind of a dedo. So let's have a look at the, f the fast merge process. So what you're going to what you're going to see is you're going to see a, a brackets that is going to say fast clone. So what do you need to configure in Veeam to do all this? You simply need to point a repository to a VFS volume or a folder on a VFS, and that's it. Veeam is taking care of the rest. We make sure the repository is set up right, configured right, and you're going to hopefully see this when you run your jobs on it. So there's no configuration to it, except for formatting your hard drives with VFS. When we're talking about synthetic uh, full on the, the copy jobs, you're going to see the same thing, fast cloning. And if you're a little bit uh, quick, you can see that it takes seconds and not minutes to do a, a complete synthetic full. If we look at the file systems, so on the right side, I have what the E drive says. Is being used. On the left side, I'm seeing what the folder says is being used. It's on the same hard drive. So the folder believes there's 511 gigs, but the E drive only got 66 gigs. This is my lab, so it's a very static data, uh, but it just shows you what it can do. So it's, there's a lot of sp sp uh, space saving in this. Of course, if I copy these files out, they're going to explode up to 511 gigs. But when they're st stuck on the disk, they're only 66. OK, another thing, I think this graph is a little bit off. I, I did it very late at night. But 
The thing is that we are, only, we are almost only doing writes. So when we do backup, we are writing, 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 and when we're doing synthetic full, we do a little bit of reading, and that's it. A little bit of uh, yeah, reading, that's it. It's a little bit of metadata that we're updating. But at least everything we're going to be just one big write operation to, to update data. And as I said before, encryption is supported. So even though we have all these files referring to blocks, some of the blocks can still be encrypted. That's fully supported. It's also very nice. And as I said before, starting up machines from, from full. So this is my ReFS. So all these, now I just put it on the edge and put, made every single day a full, just to show that what we can do. Uh, and from all these full backup files, I can actually do repower. So even though it's, you can kind of say, compressed and space saving or deduped, you can still do uh, vpower directly from it without any penalty, performance penalty. So this technology, what can we do with it? Let's have a look at the backup jobs. So with normal backup chains like seven, four, seven days, 14 days, or 30 days, we don't expect any space savings because we're still going to run with one full and X amount of incre incremental, OK? So there's not going to be any space saving there. but uh, but we will still have the fast merges, so it's still recommended to run VFS because we're going to merge files very, very quick. And now we also recommend that you, you switch into reverse incremental because it doesn't cost IOPS to run reverse incrementals. So now you can have the full in front of your chain. So your last restore point is your full. And that gives you a lot of benefits if you want to start up from it or copy it away, or whatever you want to do. So recommendations right now is, as I see it, uh, that you can run reverse incremental on all your backup jobs. But you can also go crazy, like I did. Oh, I want to run a full every day. Go ahead. The space, the amount of space I use in these two chains is the exact same. Because this, all these guys are just referring to the same blocks. So the, the space used on the hard drives is the same. So go crazy. You can even go e even more crazy. We can make these extremely long chains that we normally would cost us a lot in, uh, in NCFS. So that would be a full, 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 full. That would cost us a lot on the NCFS. But now we can make 30, in this example, uh, 63 days. That's just going to fill up one full and 62 incrementals in reality because all these fools are referring to each other, OK? So backup copy jobs. Here is where the big space savings comes in. So if we look at how we dedupe today, so Windows natively, we say that it, it compromises and dedupes data down to, to like the half, the half the size, <coughs> like two to one. And on global dedupe appliances and global dedupe technologies, you would get something like 10 and upwards. Of course, on a, on a long period or on a lot of data. So where, where does this uh, ReFS comes in uh, when we talk about uh, deduplication and space saving? Where would we place this? Well, looking at retention of classic grandfather, father, son, retention within five years, we expect it to be something between three to eight times. Space savings. Is that a good alternative to uh, global dedupe? I think so. Because if we take to in account what we need, we have full performance here. We have no performance gain uh, losses here. Where on global dedupe, we have a lot of performance uh, decreasing because of, of dedupe. So that's why we're placing this. Whether you should buy this or this for long term retention, it's up to you. Okay, another thing that's very, really cool about ReFS is that we can place it on um, Microsoft Storage Spaces or Storage Spaces Direct. So what is that? That is actually a scale-out file system technology. So what you can do is you can take some servers with flash drives and spinning disks and put them into a cluster. And then when you cluster them up together, you can create storage pools you can decide whether these storage pools are going to run with protection. If you want a classic mirroring or uh, parenting, you can, you can build it like that. 
And then on top of that, we, we build these uh, virtual volumes. So that means that these volumes we can format with VFS. So now suddenly we get a, fit, a scale out file server delivered directly from Microsoft technology. Now suddenly we can build our own scale out backup repository and put VFS on top of it. So scalability. The core feature of store spaces is that we can scale. It stretches outwards. And you can also add more disks to each and every single node and, and, and build it upwards. Uh, just remember that uh, uh, store spaces are with a few nodes within the standard uh, license. And when you extend a certain amount, I, was it four nodes? You have to have the four nodes, you have to have the data center license. So there's no, Microsoft does, doesn't give it away for free. So just note that we, we can build some really cool store spaces, but when we get up in large, large scale, we need the data center license. But it also means that we can make four pair type, p, p terabyte uh, of storage pools and format them with VFS. So that's also very, very big repositories. Another cool thing about storage spaces and putting storage spaces below VFS is that it can stage. We can use SSD drives and flashes to do some um, uh, yeah, staging, right? So our reads and writes can be even cast and, and so forth. So that's also very cool. Uh, just remember that the, if you're running storage spaces uh, direct, it can be triggered uh, real time. But if it's a classic store spaces without direct, it's a little bit of a difference. Uh, it's a schedule based. So cost, why is this also important? Well, first of all, you, you can probably record that this is a Microsoft server. So you guys can go out and buy whatever brand you want. Uh, we, we're not going to tell you what brand you, you have to buy. But you can, you can buy any brand, general purpose. And you can build on JBot because Microsoft is taking care of every single hard drive in their, their software. So you don't have to build big RAID systems and then present it to service. You simply just add a lot of boxes with a lot of local disk and Microsoft will rate the whole thing and, and, uh, and create the scale out on top of just spinning disks. So the cost, keep the cost down. And then a lot of people saying, well, what about Microsoft, uh, Microsoft and Dedupe? Can we, can we just enable Windows dedupe on top of this? Well, right now it's not supported, so you cannot enable dedupe on VFS. But Microsoft has created it as a plug-in feature, so we definitely expect either Microsoft or third party to come in with some kind of uh, dedupe plugins. I just want to check the time. So we expect that a Windows dedupe is going to make this even more fun with adding that to the chain. But again, remember, every time we introduce some dedupe technology, the penalty, well, except for our pointer technology here, but global uh, dedupe will kill your restore times, or not kill, make them worse. Uh, yeah, I think I said about that. Dedupe encryption file possible. Yeah, I think that's a... So what about... When we get these big, big, big file systems, let's imagine that we build like a, a hundred terabytes, or two hundred terabytes, or three hundred terabytes repository. But how do we how do we make sure that it's is is checked and it's healthy? Well, it's actually built in in VFS. So VFS, you can kind of say can run a check disk while you run. You can you can actually not go into the console and say uh, I want to ch uh, check disk. Uh, what is it called? Disk. Check disk. Check disk. Is it called disk? Yeah. You cannot run check disk on a VFS because it's running continuously in the background. Let's imagine that one hard drive gets corrupt or something happens that it, it's a bit. Then VFS will detect it in the file system and say, hey, hang on, this file is corrupt. And then it will jump down and find the parent key or the mirror down for storage spaces and then it will correct the data. So it's continually healthing, health checking itself. So no needs for maintenance. So that's the big problem when we talk about large file systems. So here's an example. So ReFS has detected that this one.txt file on the E drive has been corrupt. And since I'm not running any kind of protection in this uh, ReFS installation, 
So I don't have a parent here, I don't have a mirror. Well, it's just going to say it's corrupt and I'm not able to recover it. But that's also very nice to know <laughs> that my files are starting to become corrupt. Corrupt. That means that there must be some kind of subsystem or something going on in the, in the hardware that is corrupting my files. But that's better than being an NTFS and not knowing it before you do restores. So that's also very cool. So how can we, can we rely on this? Is it, a, is it a reliable? Well, as I said before, Microsoft is betting everything on this. It came out in server 2012, I think it was, the first version. 20, 2012 R2, it was not ready for production, but we, it was in the GUI and all that. And now Microsoft said, this is the file system. But just to put a bracket on it, you cannot boot from VFS. So they're still depending on NTFS to boot. So that's a little thing missing there, but uh, I hope they get it fixed, uh, figure that out. As I said before, it's streamlessing, stream, streamless uh, recovering uh, arrows underneath. Yeah. I just want to get this in. So all the things that we're really asking for repositories, we're getting out of file, uh, Microsoft file system. Microsoft technology. So what we're asking when we're building uh, when we're building repositories, we're asking for scalability that we can build on it. We're asking for performance. Well, we're getting 100% performance if we're not running Windows DDoP. Cost. Well, you can buy it on every vendor's list, so they are competing. Everybody. Uh, correction control and can we can we rely on it? Most definitely. Microsoft is betting on it, we are betting on it, everybody's got focus on this. So I hope that's, uh, that gives you an idea of what we can do on storage spaces and, and VFS on top. And just in general VFS, you don't need to run storage spaces, you can just format your local RAID 5 with VFS and then you get all these benefits. So, over to you, Prem. Just move this get up, down in your height. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, so the, the next thing that I'll talk a bit about is um, our visa and integration. Um, so the reason I wrote that integration is obviously better than compatibility is that you'll probably see a lot of vendors out there claiming that, yeah, sure, we can back up from vSAN because vSAN relies on the exact same APIs as we've been using for backups for forever. So if you see competitors out there saying that, well, we have support for vSAN, that's fine. But I'm quite confident that Veeam is the only vendor out there who has such deep integration as we'll be presenting here today. So uh, I just want to mention here before we start off that um, I'm, I'm the lead solution architect, so I get to work with a lot of really cool people. Uh, Luca is one of them, and Luca actually made this presentation at the VMware user group in Italy. So I stole mo most of his work to deliver this presentation, so I just want to give him, give him credit for that. So if you don't uh, follow him on Twitter, do that, check his blog. And uh, he posts all this really, really, really good stuff. And, uh, and, and this presentation part, partially is, is one of them. So a good thing about Luca is also that he's really well connected. And uh, his blog is also being, being watched by uh, some, some of the, uh, the good guys from, from over from VMware. So Duncan Epping, who is uh, also presenting here today on vSAN, uh, gave, gave some credit for, uh, for Luca here. Cormac, who's also a really, really important guy in, inside VMware. But most importantly, we have obviously Captain Vsan, who really wants to <laughs> go into bed with Veeam. So this is really, really exciting stuff, and it's not just uh, support uh, and how that actually works. I'll, I'll just uh, go over that in, in the next couple of minutes. So the way vSAN works is pretty much what Martin just explained for uh, Storage Spaces Direct, right? So we have a lot of hosts. We have internal storage. We have uh, cache tier, and we have a, a capacity tier. So inside each and every host, we have read and write cache in, on fast storage, and then we have capacity on some slower storage. So it could be NVMe in an all-flash system for cache. It could be SSD in, uh, in, in, in a more hybrid model. So in this example, we will talk about uh, the RAID 1 model, which is available in all the vSAN editions, because if you go higher up, you'll also see erasure coding being available. Uh, it will just, like, overcomplicate the, uh, the sake of the example here. Um, because RAID 1 is very simple. It means we have two copies of our data, and they spread across two nodes. So I hope that makes sense. So if we um, look at 
the UI, so vSphere Web Console. I, I guess most of you have discovered there is actually a web console now, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is also where we manage everything vSAN. And uh, in vSAN, we can actually see where our data is located. Our data is located in this example. You see on the bottom, ESX4 is our host. Uh, we have another uh, replica of the same information on ESX number one. And then we also have a witness on ESX number three. So what that actually means is that as long as ESX4 and ESX1 can communicate, then they will be able to establish what is called a quorum. So they will agree that, okay, ESX4 is now the owner of this data, and let's say that we pull the network cable between ESX4 and ESX1, then they can still communicate with ESX3, both of them, and ESX3 will then be the coordinator that tells which one is still uh, is, is the owner uh, and establish quorum with, uh, with a voting system. So it's, it's, it's pretty easy. So just to illustrate what we saw in, uh, in the previous image, so what we saw here, this is the placement of, uh, of those uh, uh, components on disk. So what we did in Veeam is basically uh, follow what vSAN is actually telling us, right? Because we know that this data is now on ESX4, ESX1, some is on ESX3. And what we definitely want to ensure when we back up from a vSAN is that we don't unnecessarily stress the network that connects the host together. Because actually in practice, we could see that a host running on ESX number two has all its data residing on ESX number four. So for normal production, that doesn't really matter because we have a cache tier. And let's say we have a 10% change rate of that virtual machine. So as long as we have 10% of all our capacity in cache, then it will run with extremely good performance. But if we start performing a full backup of that virtual machine, then we will start to read 100% of that data through the wrong host and actually stress out the backend network of our vSAN cluster. So this is really what we try to communicate with vSAN and get a better understanding about where does the data actually reside, and then respect that in our, what we call intelligent load balancer and assign the, uh, the proxies accordingly. So in this ideal design, we have, in this example, a four node cluster. That would also mean we should deploy four proxy servers. That might actually sound a bit excessive, but if you are familiar with Veeam, then you would know that proxy servers are also really, really lightweight. So they don't consume any disk storage, so it could eff effectively be a Windows Server 2016 core edition. So really, really small footprint. And then it only consumes some CPU and some memory, and it only consumes that resource when it's actually backing up. So it's a really, really lightweight component that we can easily distribute across all the nodes in the cluster. So how do we ensure that they actually stay on there? Well, good old DRS rules, right? So now we create a DRS rule that pins each of those proxies to the corresponding host, and then we can make sure that they actually reside. We have at least one proxy running on every uh, host in the cluster. Is that clear so far? Good. Since it's a virtual storage, right, we do not do direct SAN connection. So we need to run in network mode or in uh, product mode. Yeah, so HotEd is effectively direct vSAN, which we'll see in just a second. But good that you're with me so far, because now we go a bit deeper. We will show logs on the screen. So uh, bear with me for a while. <laughs> Not one. Right. So now we start a backup. We start a backup job. And um, the first thing we do is actually to query of vCenter. So we first ask vCenter, uh, let's just scroll through this, it's quicker. We will see that we have a VMDK file for, uh, for this virtual machine, and it resides with data on each of these nodes, and they all have a different size. So some nodes contain more storage than other ones. And in this example, it's pretty simple. We have a RAID 1 across two nodes, so both those two nodes contain the same data, and the third node only contained the witness, right? So the witness, really small amount of data, two others, a lot of data. That's effectively what we need to know here. So now we need to figure out, okay, what to do with this information? And um, this is where we do the mode evaluation. And the mode evaluation is actually something we built a couple of versions back because what is really important when we back up from NFS with virtual proxies is that we use a proxy that resides on the same host as that virtual machine. 
So if any of you ever tried to back up with this hot add mode on NFS, you'll probably see a lot of locking and so on. So basically, we reuse some of the same technology for vSAN. And what you will see here is that we have two modes. One is called hot add different host, and one is called hot add same host. And we will always try to give priority to the hot add same host, because then we have the shortest available path to the blocks that we're actually backing up. So in this example, we can see that host number one is hot add different host. Next one is hot add same host. So both uh, one, three, and four will get hot add same, same host. And the, f uh, the only um, proxy that did not contain something would be different host. But we can see that we, got, that we actually assigned proxies three with same host as well. But that will now get disqualified because we know that it contained basically no information, even though it actually did host some of that. Right? So in this example, we could use proxy one and proxy four, and we simply go through the last step where we select the best possible proxy, which is also the one where the virtual machine is running. In this case, it would be proxy number four. So we actually go through an election process to figure out where do we have the shortest possible communication path for the data blocks. In this example, it happens to be on the same host where the virtual machine is actually running. In real life, especially if you run erasure coding, you will see data blocks distributed all over the cluster. And this example will get much more complicated very, very quickly. So if you want to take care that you don't overload the cluster network on your vSAN environment, then it's really, really important that you look for a vendor that don't just claim support for vSAN, but you also look for a vendor who actually evaluates all this logic that sits behind vSAN <coughs> and do the right thing. Uh, for the backups. So in summary, we query the location of the blocks, and we assign the best possible proxy for that job. And um, yeah, as I said in the beginning, it's much more than just VADP integration, which is the API for, for data protection. Cool. Yeah, so um, nice and short. Um, any questions for that? Good. Maybe we can uh, show yeah. a little bit on uh, GUI. I can see got a GUI here. Where's the mouse? Yeah. I need to get it on my screen first. Hang on a second. I will be there. Connect. Of course, I'm disconnected. That's a classic. So let's see. Here it goes. Hopefully it will size up. So just to go back to the VFS integration. So I've gone really, really crazy to get some numbers. So here I'm selecting 99 weeks, one month, quarters. Uh, and normally these guys will become 99 full. And when I go into my file system, I will also see that I will get a lot of fools for every, come on, classic, right? Hello? No? I don't want to say how I click fit. Come on, yeah. I can see, you can see all my weekly, my quarterly, my monthly, and they're all VBK files, and if I take all the files and ask the file system, what is the size? 391 gigs, and I go out and ask the, this is really hard to stand like this. Oh. That is all the fiscal, 86 gigs. Of course, this is a lab with not a lot of stuff going on. There's a couple of scripts running, but, but it's just to show how, how ReFS can really save a lot of data. Uh, another thing I want to highlight while we're here, and I think we, we went a little bit too fast on our presentation, is that we're now doing backup of physical servers. So we now announce that we're doing backup of physical servers just the way that we do backup of virtual servers. So it's still image-based, and it still goes into our Veeam backup and replication console. 
which give us the ability to, to actually lay, uh, make restores in, in the virtual environment of physical servers. And, uh, and also, we can, we can do backups of virtual machines lying in public clouds. So imagine your company decides to, to deploy an environment in Azure or Amazon or my, uh, IBM's cloud. Yeah, now we can actually use our agents to do backup of all those VMs all around the world and bring them back into your VM console. And if shit hits the fans out there, you can recover in your own environment. Because it's physical or OS backup from within the, the, the OS, image-based. So that's really, really cool. The second thing I want to highlight is also that we announced Office 365 backup. So I'm just going to highlight this. It's the second thing. Come on, mouse. So we also announced now that we are going to come out with a, a new product that we're going to do backup of Office 365. And we're going to start out with, with focusing on mails. Um, so we're going to have an agent kind of thing running in your own data center. It's going to run, connect to the Office 360 subscription, and back up the users that you decided in Office 365. So you don't have to back up all the users, just the one you, you select. And then it will be a license based on a per user in Office 365. So the cool thing about the way we implemented it is that we are backing it up into our classic repositories. So you will see the whole, all the things that we can do today with the Veeam Explorer for Exchange, we can do with Office 365. And another thing I want to highlight today is that if you are a customer uh, before December uh, 30, 31st this year, you will get this product for free for one year if you're a standard or enterprise license. Or if you already have an Enterprise Plus license, you get this product for free for two years. So enough. it's pretty cool that we're going to give it away for free. And pro people always ask me, yeah, you're going to give it away for free for one year or two years, but what's it, what is it going to cost when it starts costing money? So we expect the cost to be a roughly 3 to $4 per user per month. So that's where we aim the list price to be at. Of course, if you have volumes, you will get discounts, but, but that's the price. So we're going we're gonna to start charging for, for backup of Office 365. And a lot of people are also asking, what about Office uh, OneDrive? And what about the SharePoint? Well, that's definitely something we're, we're looking at, and that's our strategy, to start doing backup of that. It's not integrated in the console? It's, it's not integrated right now in the console. I don't think it will be, right? Will it be integrated in the backup and replication console? Right now, it's a separate product because people can buy this as a separate product. You don't need the backup server for it. So right now, it's a separate product. Right, so there, there is some sort of integration for this tool. Um, so the, way they recommend, the recommended way to deploy it is that you create a separate virtual machine. You install the software inside this virtual machine. Then it connects to your Office 365 account, back up the mailboxes that you select. But the file format that we save this data into is not a Veeam backup format. It's actually a Microsoft JIT database, which happens to be the format of Exchange Server itself. So this basically means that if you back up the virtual machine containing the backup from your Office 365, and you back up that virtual machine with backup and replication, you'll be able to use Veeam Explorer for Exchange and actually look, look at it as if it was any other Exchange Server that you were running on-prem. Yeah, so you can see this one as, as a kind of ex Exchange Server archiving mails from Office 365. Look at it like that. And it's a per user, not a per mailbox. It's a per user. So shared mailboxes are free of charge. I think that's what we want to bring today. Anybody has some questions? If you're already a Veeam customer, make sure you jump in and sign up for getting the free license. You might as well do it. You get it for free, and then you can test it out. Cool? OK. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs>